Okay, so I'm Ines and uh, she's Sara and uh, we are both uh, working on a blog and we are going to tell you a little bit of hands-on on how to do peer review. So it's supposed to be a workshop and uh, we are going to uh, to show you uh, it's in our journals as a, as a model <laughs> and uh, yes, get into the detail. So first we are going to tell you who we are and uh, then we will go through the what responsibilities you have as a reviewer, uh, what peer review means at blog, the good and the bad, uh, why you review, get involved in peer review, and finally the future of peer review. And uh, we are hoping to do a bit of an interactive uh, session, so we may ask you to pick up your phone. Not very adventurous, I know. <laughs> have a lot of time. So who is blog? So, by the way, we are going to switch back and forward, so we will talk different sections of the class. I hope you don't get uh, dizzy. So blog was um, the result of uh, mainly, do, we, do I have a point here? Mainly of uh, Pat Brown. So Pat Brown uh, had a lab in Stanford, and uh, he was, I don't know if you know, one of the inventors of microarrays. And uh, of course, he produced a huge amount of data. And when he was publishing his, uh, his research in a great journal of or, or science, he was very frustrated because he had all this amount of data and it was never available to the public. Uh, so he was thinking about solutions on how to make this available and without paying money to all the researchers that uh, were so he uh, started having conversations, informal conversations, with Harold Darwood, one of the on the left, uh, who was his supervisor, so the postdoc, and, uh, and with uh, a postdoc from his own lab, uh, Mike Aitken. So the three of us, of them, uh, got together and started talking and thought, well, let's do something about this. And uh, what they did was to create blog, the public library of science. And this is our mission. So BLOG is a non-profit uh, organization, and uh, we, our mission is to accelerate progress in science and medicine by leading transformation in research communication. So this is how it started. The idea was that uh, you would just send a paper, and if we were going to publish it, uh, we would pay a fee, and then everybody would have access to it. Instead of paying every time that someone would want to see each paper uh, a fee. So they circulated an open letter and it was signed by many, many reviewers. I was a PhD student at the time. I signed the letter. I thought it was very exciting. Uh, and then, of course, they tried to get funding and they got uh, super lucky and they got nine million uh, from the Moore Foundation. And in 2000 they started blog, and the first uh, journal was called Priority. So I work in Blog Priority. Oh, sorry. Okay. So this is the timeline of uh, of blog. Uh, in 2004, uh, Blog Medicine was launched. In 2005, uh, they were the community journals, as we call it. They are run by academic editors. Uh, so it's PLOS Computational Biology, PLOS Genetics, PLOS Pathogens. In 2006 came PLOS One, that I'm sure that uh, everybody has, has heard about it. It's the, uh, the world's lar largest journal so far. And then a bit later, uh, PLOS Neglected Tropical Disease came. And uh, these are more uh, points in the timeline. So we published in 2012 the 15,000 article. We had our 10th anniversary in 2013, 100,000 article in 2014, and last year we celebrate the 10th year anniversary of PLOS One. And this is a summary slide of uh, the highlights of uh, 2016. So far we have published PLOS 100,000 articles, all peer review and uh, 
I became last year only 20,000, 27,000, and uh, it has some steps that you will interested in. Sarah? Okay, so after this brief introduction, I'm just going to go a bit into the more nitty gritty of the talk. Um, we're going to start with just some basic responsibilities uh, of peer reviewers. So according to the um, Committee of Publication Ethics, the uh, Committee of Publication Ethics is an um, organization that was founded in 1987 by journal editors, initially a small group of UK journal editors. And now they have more than 10,000 members, I believe, and um, includes all those people that are interested in the publication ethics um, and your editors. So according to the Committee or, of, on Publication Ethics, or COPE, peer reviewers are external experts chosen by editors to provide written opinions with the end of improving the study. So a lot, many times, particularly from an author's perspective, <laughs> We can see the peer review process as a struggle to publish, uh, as people that are just there to put us down, reject our papers, make life difficult for us. But actually, the aim is really to improve, as, I, as we see, the quality of the paper. Uh, so it's for the benefit of the wider community, as we see. There are several uh, things you should be considering once you are invited to uh, peer review an article. First of all, uh, you should consider whether you have the right expertise uh, to do so. You might be really keen on reviewing a paper, but actually you, it maybe falls too far away from your area of expertise, or, or maybe some of the methodology is far too complex, so it's really important to recognize your limitations. Um, also, consider whether you have the time to do so. Um, we all want to... Uh, our, manuscripts to get published as quickly as possible and want to be efficient so it's important to try to uh, provide your reviewers in a timely manner. Accuracy, um, it's quite important to, to be objective and accurate as possible uh, and provide specific points that the authors can action if possible. And another important thing is to take into consideration the ethics of random publication. So, as we say, um, you might identify one of the authors as one of your collaborators. Uh, you have recently published it with them. Um, for, in our case, in PLOS, we consider any uh, past collaboration or publication in the last five years as a potential conflict of interest, which we think it could jeopardize how the, um, um, the, peer re the review process is perceived. So even if you don't cons consider it to be a competing interest, is what the other committee might perceive as being a potential competing interest that should be the important thing. Just think if you were put in the same position and people ask a question, ask a question in your work just based on the peer review, whether you would, be, you would like to be in that position. Um, there's more information about this in the yeah, Communication of Publication Ethics, which link is provided there. I really strongly encourage everybody, if you haven't checked so, to do so. This is basically the, um, yeah, as I said, the, how it looks the first uh, page of the COP. Um, and it clearly states that it's a forum for editors and policies of peer review journals to discuss all, all uh, aspects of publication ethics. Um, it's quite interesting as well because there are cases of particular misconducts or breaches of uh, publication ethics that are really interesting. And you could learn something about it, yeah. And um, particularly for peer reviewers, uh, they provide. Um, ethical guidelines, which you can follow and download as a PDF, um, summarizing the basic principles to which peer review should adhere, as well as the expectations, not only while you are peer reviewing, but as well after post-publication, post which are your um, the expectations from, uh, for peer reviewers. I'm just going to continue. And, uh, I'm going to tell you what peer review means uh, at PLOS. So using PLOS as an example. Unfortunately, we are not very innovative in a peer review, but uh, um, we, we will uh, finish it, uh, the workshop, just trying to think about new ways. Uh, so one of the main things that uh, you have to take into consideration when you review a paper is the scope of the journal that you are reviewing for. So I advise you strongly to first go to the website of the journal and see what is the scope 
So we have clot biology and uh, the other donor, which is the clot one, where uh, this hope you have to have an exceptional, significant uh, piece of research, which has to be original and it has uh, to have relevance for uh, all areas of uh, biological science. So very broad scope and uh, novel and significant, which um, a lot of donors. In plus one, uh, the, the scope is, is different. So they, they want to publish papers that are, that they are um, scientifically uh, rigorous, uh, preferred, and uh, it doesn't really matter if a piece of research is novel. And you have uh, natural science, medical research, engineer, and, uh, and other social sciences. So as far as um, this, uh, so the science is sound, uh, we will publish it. And actually one of the main focus now in uh, plus one is uh, reproducibility, uh, where if you publish uh, another piece of research that you, and you get the same results, it means that uh, the result, uh, the, the study is solid. And they also publish the negative results. So other, well, so these are the, the, um, the criteria that uh, you should consider. What is the scope? Uh, it has to be rigorous research and a high technical standard. Uh, the contribution for the field, so it has a broad scope or it's just specific for uh, some scientists. The novelty is required and uh, very importantly, data sharing. So as you hear about uh, our funders, uh, we are very interested in sharing the data. So everything that, ha that is published has to be shared and there are no exceptions. Uh, so this is uh, something that is very important and you, you should check if you review for our donors. Yeah, so um, in this section, we just try to uh, provide some examples of uh, what we consider to be good and um, bad uh, reviews. So we try to keep it uh, quite um, general, so because we weren't sure <laughs> which are your backgrounds, you might be from different disciplines, so they're just general examples, and maybe if we can just discuss this together, that would be great. So this is just um, a case. Uh, where an author was giving a presentation at a national meeting about whatever, uh, about um, a paper which was peer reviewed recently but was rejected uh, from, the, from a journal, so it's not published yet. Uh, a member of the audience who was not involved in the peer review, so the uh, peer review was uh, open and he knew who had, uh, who had reviewed the paper, so he knew or she knew that this was one of the peer reviewers, asked questions to the author from a copy of the manuscript and not from the talk they gave. So uh, can you see any wrongs or, or any improper interaction in this uh, scientific uh, yeah, interaction? Do you think this is correct or would you be worried about anything in particular? Um, are you worried that a person that wasn't involved in the peer review process of a uh, article that hasn't yet been published as a copy of the manuscript. So we thought that this is quite scary. It's a breach of confidentiality. It's a, in fact a, a case. It's a case number from the Committee of Publication Ethics. You can look up to it and you can look at the resolutions. So in this uh, committee, um, journals or people that are concerned about particular pra practices can ask for advice. And this was one of the cases that was put to them. In this case, um, it was found that there must have been a breach of uh, confidentiality, so perhaps the reviewer went to the pub, talked to his mates about uh, this fantastic paper or this crappy paper that he was reviewing, blah, 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 and circulated a copy freely to the lab, uh, to the lab members, <laughs> which resulted in a breach of confidentiality. Uh, so yeah, it's quite important to um, consider when you are reviewing a paper that until that is published, it's not public. It's somebody else's work. And if you were in the other position, perhaps you wouldn't want your work to be discussed so openly if it hasn't been yet published or you're not presented in a, in a conference. 
this is just another uh, example of uh, a review. Um, here we have just tried to take in out the uh, things that uh, are more related to the science, just for you to have a little look and think whether the, the tone of the review is adequate or whether you have phrased things differently. So we have just highlighted a few things. So overall, the work tackles an interesting topic and sheds new light on the influence of whatever. The scientific rationale for the investigation is sound, and the authors present a few novel and important observations that provide a logical extension to previous work, blah, blah, blah. However, some information is missing and should be provided to clarify, um, should be provided to clarify a few issues. Um, additional experiments are required to strengthen the study and support the author's conclusions. Uh, then they come to uh, point the, uh, the issues that should be addressed. So major criticisms. Um, data significance appears to be overestimated in some of the graphs based on the visual inspection of the images. However, it's very difficult to make a proper evaluation because there is information missing, blah, 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 blah. Do you think that the tone here is adequate or are they being too harsh? Will you reference things differently? Um, So yeah, so we thought that although they are being critical, so they have a general, so it's, it's nice to notice how this changes the structure. They start with positive remarks. We all like to hear positive things about work. It's really nice. And they explain that they think it's fairly good. And then they come to point out the things that might be flaws, that might be uh, um, yeah, missing. Particularly, yeah, experiments, uh, data, so, it is quite common to, to start with a general overseeing of the, of the manuscript and then try to distill that into actionable points because it's very nice for somebody to just praise your work or to criticize hardly your work, whatever. But what you want as, as an author is probably actionable points that you can do something about to improve your work. So this is um, from Embo Journals. Uh, Embo publishes uh, all the uh, reviews, so it's a very good uh, source also for information. You can just check there. Not all of them are open, meaning that not all of them are signed, but at least you can check the decision process, how the editor came to accept, how many rounds of the revisions have been, the response from the authors. It's, it's really good uh, if you want to gain some experience about also the tone, because sometimes it's not so much what you say, but how you say it. We are all humans, we are all a bit sensitive about our work. You might be working that piece of work for the last five years. <laughs> you don't want to hear that it's absolutely crap. So coming to that, these are some quotes about uh, real reviews. So one of them, the authors are seemingly ignorant of much of the literature. Well, this could have been rephrased perhaps to say, I would strongly advise the author of this paper to rewrite the introduction and discussion to include more up to the reference data and then provide a nice list of references. Um, we can get similar meaning in both of them. We know that <laughs> the review <laughs> was not very happy with the, with the background information that was provided by the authors. But with the first one, it's just putting it down the author. Well, the second one actually is giving you actionable, actionable items that you can take to improve your work. To mention, when providing references, it's very important just not to provide those by yourself. I mean, we all like our work to be cited, which is brilliant, and it could be very relevant. But there's also a very common uh, misconduct to just uh, cite your own work or, or that of your collaborators to inflate your citations, which is not ideal. So within reason, of course, you can propose your work to be cited. But there's no limit to only your work. Yeah. So. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, um, so I work for Plus One, so we do have we do see quite a lot of uh, articles. So unfortunately, some of them are not picked up because we don't take every editorial decision. We haven't got the capacity, nor the means, and we don't have academic editors uh, who. <laughs> whose role is to oversee the peer review process. Uh, but there are cases yeah, where we, yeah, we pick up the tone. Um, some, yeah, so it's a, there, I think there is a fine line between being critical and being constructively critical. And sometimes it's not, yeah, as I say, not so much what you are saying, but how you are saying it. And it's very useful to put yourself in the oldest person's position 
if somebody, I'm not native, obviously I have a very strong Spanish accent, <laughs> that's fine. If they tell me your language is poor, it needs to be revised perhaps for, uh, by a native speaker or a professional company, you can say that. But if somebody says, well, this English is rubbish, I cannot even understand it, it might as well just be toilet paper, well, <laughs> how are you going to react to that? So it's, it's the tone often what is the problem, not so much the message. And we do, we do get quite a, quite a few issues, particularly also um, from the other side, when reviewers perhaps uh, is not, English is not the first language, it can sound a bit harsher than they actually mean. Thankfully, um, at least in PLOS, we have the capacity of contacting academic editors, have a chat with them and see whether the person responsible for the review or the decision letter should be contacted to give them some guidance about how things should be rephrased. So although we don't pick all of them, just from the scale side, we try to do our best. So I cannot talk for PLOS Biology, but for PLOS One, we do have a peer reviewer um, rating system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so academic editors, based on how useful the review is deemed to them or not, uh, because yeah, sometimes even even if it's not damaging, maybe there's a one-liner saying like, yeah, it's fantastic, publish it. That's not really useful. And it's not even clear to me whether you have read the paper, at least if you have given the academic editor, a little summary of your expectations of what you thought, even if it was no comments, no major criticism, minor criticisms, but just a brief summary in your own words, I would have got the impression you have read the paper. So maybe it's not very useful. And the academic editors get the choice to um, rate, rate the review. Then there is an average in, I don't know how it works exactly, the algorithm. So then when academic editors invite reviewers, they can see the grading to see how, other, how useful other academic, academic editors have found that reviewer in particular. Um, yeah, although we don't uh, oversee every single decision, it's impossible, and that's, we don't believe that that's our role because we believe that the community should self-regulate to a certain extent. We try to contact the people who might require some more advice or guidance, and we do provide yeah, webinars, training courses, to try to improve uh, the type of feedback that they give. As for close biology? Yes, yeah, so I mean, all this is obviously internal because uh, if some, someone does something wrong, you don't want to put it in a yeah. banner and say, oh, this person is doing a bad review. Uh, but uh, we do contact uh, directly the reviewers, and uh, I normally rewrite the sentence and suggest some wording in case they're very busy and, uh, and they don't want to rewrite it. So you don't have an excuse of, I don't have the time to do this. So I will write a paragraph and I send it to the reviewers and we say, we thought this was a bit rough uh, and uh, we think this should be rewarded before. We are not going to send this to the authors, so if you want us to send it, uh, you can either choose or give us permission to send this or rewrite the paragraph if you want to. And normally the reaction is uh, embarrassment and, uh, and they, they do better next time, hopefully. Yeah. It has so to be said that yeah, in most cases, uh, we are lucky enough that the people who have we contacted that seems to be sensible. So a lot of the time, yeah, when you are pushed with time, you might just rush write something and maybe it didn't come as well as you would have wanted to to communicate your message. So we haven't had, at least from my personal experience, I haven't had those cases where they have said no, I absolutely won't change my the tone of my review. This stands as it is. Most of the time, if you talk rationally to a person, the reply you get is also rational. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and then thankfully for the worst, worst cases, uh, we have institutions such as Hope, which are always there to try to provide advice or guidance if there is a difficulty in the peer review process for both authors, editors, and reviewers as well. So this is just another example of uh, peer review. <laughs> the point is so elementary that it does not require a manuscript of this length to develop it which could have been rephrased perhaps to, I will strongly advise the authors to shorten the manuscript to ensure that the point comes clearly across or whatever. Basically, the reviewer thought that the manuscript was far too long, fair enough, sometimes we get bored by reading the same things over and over, but it could have been put in a different way.
Okay, so we thought we would give you some um, points on how to write a good review. Uh, probably nothing that uh, is not new for you, uh, but uh, we thought it was worth nevertheless to go through that. Uh, as we said, when you're an author and you receive your reviews, you like to have a nice comment, the good and the bad. And uh, so, what I would advise you is to focus first on the positive. Uh, so just try to think what this uh, paper is going to, uh, to add to the science in that field and write all the positive aspects. Then you give feedback and of course in a constructive way. Uh, do not try to get aggressive, just rephr rephrase. Uh, your sentences. A good exercise is when you finish the review, read it again and see if uh, you would like to, to receive this review. Uh, are there any experiments missing to support the conclusions? So you have to focus in the main experiment. So we don't want really endless uh, uh, studies published that uh, discover <laughs> absolutely anything in the world. Research is, uh, is very, very broad. So the paper has to uh, simply support the conclusions that the paper claims to support. So just focus on those and highlight, highlight them as key. Check the stats. So everybody has, I mean, I don't think you can give the excuse of, I don't know anything about the stats. Everybody has to have the basic knowledge of the stats. It's just part of being a scientist. Uh, so you have to check to see if, uh, they, they analyze data where the differences are really small. They really cannot uh, use uh, an, an analysis that tests for differences that are very big. So everything has to be uh, customized. And perhaps the statistical analysis is, is wrong because they use the wrong analysis and they get completely different results. So that's very important. Remember, you are really not a copy editor. So that's one we are not asking. We are asking of you. Uh, we we do have many journals have copy editors, and when the paper is going to be published, the professional copy editors are going to check it. So do not check if you are missing an S or something is uh, the verb is not right. What you can do is to check if uh, the, it's written by a by a, a non-speaking, uh, not English-speaking speaker, um, if the English is clear or not. Uh, it can be simple, but uh, if it's not clear, nobody's going to understand the paper. And uh, if some of the sentences uh, need to be clarified, you have to point out that as well. Are there results or conclusions overstate? So that's a very, very common thing in papers, even the ones that are published in Nature Science. They are uh, amazing writers uh, among scientists, but they manage to bluff the way and uh, they are very skillful in saying um, I am showing this and you don't realize but they don't show what they are saying <laughs> uh, but you don't realize so you should check that uh, are they actually showing experiments uh, supporting these statements if not you have to point it out uh, are there any key references missing again you have to cite uh, your own work if it's not relevant, uh, but uh, if they say someone published this, this uh, or is known already this, they have to, uh, to mention what reference uh, is there. And if it's wrong, you should point it out. Are the figure or figure legends uh, representative of the text? Check all the figures, see if uh, they're not clear, they're too small, they're too big, if they can be improved, if the colors are all wrong or confusing, and check also the figure legends. Are they representative of the text? Are they missing some information? And uh, I forgot to put it, but uh, you actually pointed out in your talk, supplementary data, that's very, very important to check. Uh, so you should, uh, you should check all with the supplementary data. Is all the data included and accessible? As I said, uh, at PLOS we are um, very focused on that. We want all the data to be included and shared with the community. So how to write my review? Uh, 
I said, you have to have a summary and your general opinion of the, of the paper. Then you should uh, highlight the major issues. So these are the issues that should be essential. So without those experiments supporting the conclusion, the paper should not be published. But there are also minor issues. So there, this includes uh, clarifications and also desirable experiments. So be honest and uh, I said, you don't want to publish an endless paper, uh, but you can put, well, the paper could be improved by, by doing this, but uh, it should not, so this should be at the, left at the discretion of the author. Authors, they should not uh, have to do this if they don't wish to waste their time to make a paper uh, beautiful. Uh, confidential comments to editors. So we do have those in plus biology, but uh, we only encourage uh, the, the authors to, to use those when you have something important to tell us that you don't want to share with the author. So um, you found in a figure something that is actually not very good. Uh, flies that is not mentioned or uh, something that looks a bit dodgy or, uh, or um, you know that uh, there is something wrong with the paper. So use the, that box to, to, to make a comment, but uh, don't use it for uh, praise the papers towards the authors and then say all the negative things towards us because that puts us in a very compromised position and uh, So um, we thought also that perhaps um, some of you might be quite early on in your research career, and perhaps you don't get as many invitations as you might wish to peer review, which don't worry, that will change for sure. <laughs> in a few years' time, you will see. So there are several things you can do to get more in, gain more experience uh, and be more proactive to get more invitations to peer review, if, if so you wish to, which I strongly encourage because it's, I think, it's a brilliant way of learning also, um, not only about what's going on in the wider community, uh, what's the, mm. the really popular science at the moment or whatever, but this is really uh, nice of getting more experience in a scientific way uh, to know how other people formulate their experiments and their studies so, and to critically evaluate papers. So I think it's, it's a great way of uh, getting more scientific experience overall. So the most straightforward way to um, uh, gain more experience is, uh, is showing an interest, uh, asking your supervisor, boss, PI, departmental head, um, whether they have, that you are showing them that you are interested and whether they have any peer reviews you can help them at. Um, usually the people with a major sen with most seniority or the people that have the mm, longest publication record, people that have stayed in the department, department for longer, they tend to get lots of publications. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> most of you will be not only peer reviews, you will also be <laughs> researchers. You have your other career, your other professional life, your personal life. So a lot of these people cannot do all the peer reviews that they will, will wish to. So often they are more than, help, uh, than happy to share this responsibility with uh, So Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's something we strongly encourage in PLOS. So you have the, although we don't operate an open peer review system, you do have the opportunity to sign your uh, review. Mm -hmm. And actually one of the questions when you do so is, did anybody help you? Did anybody help you in this peer review? So both people are recognized because it is true that if you are early on in your career, in your career, um, your supervisor, PI, boss, might still be overlooking. So they might provide some critical input into your work, even if the review was mainly done by you. So we acknowledge that both uh, people, those both persons' roles should be credited. Both the boss, or PI supervisor, or whatever, but as well as the PhD or younger career researcher. I think it's very important to yeah, improve the transparency of the peer review process overall. So yeah, at PLOS, you have the opportunity. Yeah. 
Yes, and, yes. And uh, if your bosses uh, wishes to disclose their name as well, you have the opportunity to include both names, both yours, uh, the bosses as well. So yeah, so that, uh, as you say, the problem, problem record, it will be a both name. Because it's, as you say, it's very common uh, practice and often it's not recognized that it's done by younger lab members or team members. I'm sorry, if you do that, I would encourage you to ask your supervisor your to add your name and yeah. make sure that it is. And make sure also that they're happy with their name to be disclosed as well. Uh, because perhaps not not everybody is uh, happy to yeah, have an opportunity to do so. Uh, another way of gaining experience, perhaps not as such an official way, is to yeah, join or start a journal club uh, to learn how to critically evaluate papers. Uh, most departments have them, even specialized ones. Uh, I know that in the ecology department here they have one only about statistics, where they only focus on the statistics of the paper, which is brilliant. Um, you might also want to get involved in Open Peer Review, yes, 1000, BioArchive. There are journals that provide uh, peer review mentoring programs. Uh, for example, on top of my head, the American uh, Psychological Association uh, and the affiliated journals provide some for junior researchers where you can just join one of these programs. Or in the first couple of uh, reviews, I believe, you are mentored by somebody else to gain some experience and you are overseen. So I will encourage you to check uh, within your discipline whether there are such programs going on uh, for mentoring. And also, you can always add uh, post-publication comments and articles. So nowadays, and nowadays, most journals allow this, PubMed also. So um, you can just, even if it's not during the peer review process, you can still critically evaluate the paper and add those comments. OK, so peer review models. I think you have heard over the day mainly all the peer review uh, models that uh, there are. Uh, so the, there is a traditional peer review, which is a single blind. So you know uh, who the author is, but uh, you don't know who you are. Um, we do encourage all reviewers to sign the reviews, and it's actually great to, to, to have this. But uh, we also give the option of uh, being anonymous. Uh, Be Life, I think you have heard this morning uh, about them, and they did a collaborative uh, review where all the identity of the reviewers are known by each other, and uh, there is a, a point in the review process when they are all they all have written the review where they interact with each other and decide what is necessary for the paper, and they send a single letter with it. Uh, there are also, or used to be, the Ashes Review. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it's now over and uh, closed down this month. Uh, but uh, it was a portable peer review, so you would pay a fee uh, to, uh, uh, to and send your paper, and, uh, and people would be asked to uh, provide a review. And with these reviews, you could go to a journal and uh, ask if they would be interested in publishing this paper. I think uh, it's a very futuristic way of uh, peer review. Unfortunately, perhaps it was a bit too early for uh, its time, but uh, I, I think we will see some more initiatives like this in the future, hopefully. And the F1000, uh, you have heard about it as well. So they just uh, publish the paper free review, and, uh, and then they contact the reviewers, and you Everybody can put, put uh, uh, can comment on review, and then the reviews are published with the paper, and the double line is where you don't know who the author is. Mm -hmm. So now the future of peer review. Yeah, I think you have already seen this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. So um, as we say in plus, we still uh, have uh, either single blind, although we encourage reviewers to, si to sign the review. Unfortunately, it's the case that, uh, I think also, as Corinna said, that we tend to see more signed ones, the ones that are more positive towards the authors, and not so much the negative ones, which is, I think is an important trend to be broken as well within PLOS. Uh, but within PLOS, we strongly believe in transparency, reproducibility, that's why we have our policies regarding ethics, data availability, minimal data sets, underlying data, raw data, and one of them is also surrounding peer review. So we, yes, we strongly believe that 
the future might be moving towards open peer review, uh, where possibly um, all the biases are left to one side and you're just judged based on the quality of work you do, not who you are or who are you evaluated by. Uh, however, as all <laughs> peer review models, we realize that they might have some cons and some pros as well. So we'll be happy to to hear your your ideas on that. Yeah. So in front of your notepad, you have a couple of post-its, um, so that we don't have to we don't have to read if you don't wish to. You can just put it in the wall or something, the pros and cons, and then we can discuss them together to see what you think, what people think, and keep it anonymous so people don't feel embarrassed if they don't wish to read aloud. Yeah. <laughs> 